Hey everyone. So the next lesson that we want to talk about is interpreting and sketching graphs of relations and functions. Now, um, yesterday we dealt with domain and range, um, and I know that that was kind of a, a heavy lesson. It was long. There was lots and lots of examples, and they were somewhat abstract. You had to be really, really careful how you wrote things down. Um, there are still things you have to be really careful of with today's lesson, but I'm hoping that today is going to feel a little bit more relaxed for you. It's going to feel like it makes a little bit more sense than yesterday's did. So hopefully it'll be a little bit, uh, I don't know, a breath of fresh air for you. Okay. So first of all, uh, which is a function between these two? Take a look at them. And remember when we're looking at something visually, we want to try and figure out does it pass the vertical line test essentially right if i draw a vertical line anywhere on the graph will it only hit the graph once um, you'll notice that for the first guy that works anywhere where i draw a vertical line it would only hit one point so that's cool but on the second one if i was to draw a vertical line say right here it would hit twice okay so this guy's not a function whereas graph A is a function. So we say graph A because it passes the vertical line test, okay? Okay, so we're gonna go through a couple of pictures here. Just as a reminder from yesterday's stuff, we're going to state whether they're a function or not, and then whether uh, or we're gonna state the domain and range, okay? So for this guy, it is a function, it passes the vertical line test. The domain for this guy, uh, well, I can be negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Now, this is discrete data. Um, it's not connected. The dots aren't connected, so nothing can exist in between the dots. Um, <clears throat> and so when I have discrete data, either I'm going to list them. I'm going to say all the values of x such that x equals negative 3, comma, negative 2, comma, negative 1, comma, 0, comma, 1, comma, 2, comma, 3. Or I can look at that and say, hey, that's every integer between negative three and three. So the other way I could do it is say negative three is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to three, comma, x is a member of the integer family, okay? Either one would have been perfectly okay. Um, so whichever one you like better there. Now, for range, um, the only thing y is is two. So there I would just say all the values of y such that y equals two. Okay, a reminder, you're not saying y or x is a member of the reals here, because as soon as you say x or y is a member of the reals, you're implying that it's continuous data, which means that there's a curve or a line there somehow. Okay, not a series of dots. Okay, how about this guy? So, is it a function? The answer to that is yes, it passes the vertical line test. Okay, if I'm looking at the domain, remember this is a computer generated graph and you can see that it spills off of the windows. So, um, that means it's going to go, this pattern that you see is going to carry on forever and ever. Um, so it's going to go from negative infinity to infinity. So in interval notation, we would say negative infinity to infinity with, with uh, curved brackets. In uh, set builder notation, we would say all the values of x such that uh, x is a member of the reals. Okay, and then for the range, well, Take a look at what your bottom is and what your top is. It never goes lower than that point there and it never goes higher than that point there. So we would say all the values of y such that, and then we're going from one to three. So we'd say one is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to three. And then y is a member of the reals. Here we do say y is a member of the reals because it's not a series of dots anymore. It's continuous data. They're all connected to each other. And then in interval notation, it's one to three. Um, but we would also use square brackets there because I can be one and I can be three. Okay. All right. Check out this guy. Um, again, it is a function. It passes the vertical line test. Um, as far as my domain, I'm starting here at neg two and I'm heading to the right. So I'm getting greater than. Um, I'm never left of neg two. So I would say x is greater than negative two and x is a member of the reals. Or in inter inter <laughs> interval notation, I would say negative two to infinity. Okay. Uh, so there we go. And then for the range, um, there is a bottom and a top to this. My bottom is at two, my top is at four. So I would say two to four, okay? 
uh, where y is a member of the reals, and then in interval notation, uh, square bracket two comma four square bracket. Okay. All right. So I have been using these words already, but again, just as a formal definition, discrete graph is a series of separate points. Uh, nothing exists in between the points, so they can't be connected. You can't sell half the ticket, okay? Those are the things you're always asking yourself. If you're trying to figure out if a context is discrete or continuous, can you get half of it? Can you sell half or can you measure half of it? Usually discrete is, um, ends up being data that you end up counting, not measuring, okay? So like you would be counting tickets. Um, if you were looking at the number of babies born at a hospital, okay, you can't have half a baby. Uh, if you were looking at, um, I don't know, the number of hats that um, school-aged children own, okay, you either own a hat or you don't own a hat. You can't own 2.7 hats, okay? So those sorts of things would be discrete. Continuous means that you can measure in between the data points. So like if you are clocking my speed, you could get me going 90 kilometers an hour, you could get me going 91 kilometers an hour, but with the right measuring device, you could get me going 90.075 kilometers an hour, right? If you had a measuring device that was specific enough to clock that exact measurement, okay? Okay, now <clears throat> this graph shows water in a bathtub as a function of time. And what we're gonna look at is um, what is happening between each segment, okay? So what does each segment of the graph represent? Compare your description with that of a, your partner. Are both stories the same? Uh, should they be? Well, yes, they should be. Um, so what we're looking at is time is on my x-axis. Depth of water is on my y-axis. So we're just going to go piece by piece together, and we're going to talk about what's happening. So what's happening between here and here? Well, time is continuing, and the depth of the water is getting deeper. So real-world context there, I'm filling up the tub with water. Okay, what's happening between A and B? So what I need you to notice here is time is still continuing, but the level of water has not changed, okay? Um, so if the level of water hasn't changed, um, I probably stop the tap. So there's no water coming into the tub anymore, um, but time continues and that's where you get the horizontal line. Now, for the next section, C to B, what I want you to notice there is there's a rapid um, a rapid increase in the depth of the water over a very short period of time. So maybe I'm getting in the tub then. A person stands and they get into the tub. The displacement of water increases right away. Okay, C to D. Um, well, person's having a bath probably. Nothing's happening. The level hasn't changed and they're there from what, just shy of eight minutes to just over 16 minutes. So eight or nine minute soak in the tub. D to E, person's getting out because there's a rapid decrease in the volume. E to F, nothing's happening there. Um, F to G, probably the person has pulled the plug and the water is now draining. Um, so as time progresses, the depth of the water is consistently getting um, lower, okay? So here are my notes on that, okay? Compare them with yours. Water's being filled, water's being turned off from A to B. Take note, I'm looking at each segment and I'm describing each segment, okay? And it's not enough to say, um, now I'm doing this. I want to know that you know you're going from point C to point D right now, okay? Be very, very specific in what you say. Okay, awesome. Okay, sketch the graph to represent the following. Okay, so now same sort of similar thing, but um, what would this picture look like? So you put the plug in the bath and turn on the taps. You leave the bathroom and return to discover that the bath has overflowed. You turn off the taps and pull out the plug to let some water out, and then you put the plug back in. Pause me, see if you can come up with a picture of that. Okay, so when you first put the plug in the bath and turn on the taps, you're gonna see an increase of water. Now, when you overflow, um, graphically, you have no way of showing that you're overflowing. All you have of showing is that you've reached the maximum depth of the water, right? As the water's pouring out of the tub, that doesn't change the maximum depth of the bathtub. So what happens there is you get a horizontal line at whatever the maximum depth is. 
then you shut the taps off and you unplug the stopper to let the water out. So now the depth will come down again. Uh, and then you put the plug back in. So then you didn't empty the tub. You just let some water out. So then you're going to level off and become a horizontal line again. So your graph should look something like this. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So again, we're just interpreting uh, what we're seeing on a graph, making sure we're able to interpret it properly. So each point on this graph represents a bag of popping corn. Which bag is the most expensive and what does it cost? So we have mass here and we have cost here. So if we're looking for most expensive, we're looking for the highest cost. So that would be bag C and it costs $7. Which bag has the least mass? So mass is down here. So we're looking at the smallest point on that scale, which would be bag B. You want to be careful that you're reading this scale correctly as well. This goes 400 to 800, which means this guy here would be 600, which means halfway through, that would have to be 500. So it's bag B with a mass of 500 grams. Okay. Uh, which bags have the same mass and what is their mass? So we're looking for bags that have the same mass. So they're in the same spot on the X axis. That would be D and E right here. And they have a mass, um, sorry, just getting my mouse back. They have a mass of 1800 uh, grams halfway in between 1600 and 2000. Okay, which bags cost the same? So now we're looking for level this way on the cost. So uh, level on the cost would actually be these guys here, A and E with a cost of $4, okay? Good, okay. Between bake C and D, which is the better value? So C is here. D is here. Well, in D, you're getting more grams for less amount of money than C. So D is the better value. Okay. Uh, determine the domain and range for this graph. This is discrete data. Um, so you're going to list the various masses for the domain and you're going to list the various costs for the range. So your domain, all the values of x such that x equals 500, 900, 1600, and 1800. And then for the range, it'll be all the values of y such that y equals two, four, five and a half, and seven. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, this graph depicts a day trip from Winkler, Winnipeg to Winkler, Manitoba. Um, and what we want to do, same as the bathtub uh, question, we want to just describe each line segment. Now, I've not written the answers on this. We're just going to talk it through together. So again, we're just going to go from each line segment and see what we see. Um, so going from zero to A, my distance is increasing as time increases. So I would want you to be very comfortable to be specific here and say, I am traveling to Winkler. The reason I know I'm traveling to Winkler right now is because of the title. The title says I'm going from Winnipeg to Winkler. So if my distance is going greater, that means I'm leaving my starting destination and heading towards, or leaving my starting point, sorry, and heading towards whatever my destination is. So I'm heading towards Winkler right now. Between A and B, the distance is not changing, but time continues. So you've stopped. Maybe you got gas, maybe you got a bite to eat. Whatever has happened, you're not moving anymore, okay? Um, so from A to B, you've stopped. From B to C, um, you are continuing to head to Winkler. And you can even say as far as at C, you have arrived at Winkler. The reason I know that is because I don't go any farther than point C as far as the distance goes. Um, and I couldn't have made the title from Winnipeg to Winkler if I didn't actually arrive at Winkler, okay? So from C to D, you are visiting Winkler. Um, you could tell me that you went, you were there from two to four hours. So altogether, you were at Winkler for two hours, hour two to hour four, okay? Um, and then from D to E, the last little section there, uh, you're heading back to Winnipeg and might be even nice in your description to say I didn't stop at all this time whereas you stopped on the way because you had that little horizontal line between A and B between D and E you've just gone straight back um, and no no pit stops on the way back okay awesome 
Okay, so let's clear that ink. Um, oh, sorry, I want to go back there for one more second because I didn't answer the other questions yet. What, why is this graph continuous? Um, again, your answer there is because the dots are connected to a line, but more than that, you need to go a little deeper and say time can be measured in very uh, small increments, as can distance, right? I can look at one kilometer distance, I can look at 0.5 kilometer distance, I can look at one minute time, I can look at 0.5 minutes time, I can look at 0.6 of a nanosecond time, right? Um, so all of those things can be broken into tiny, tiny chunks, and that's why um, the graph is continuous. What are the independent and dependent variables? Remember that your x is always your independent and your y is always your dependent. So um, time is independent here, and the distance is dependent, okay? All right, so for a graph of distance as a function of time. Now again, I want you to notice the phrase as a function of, okay? Um, that is always y as a function of x. So as soon as you see as a function of, you can say, okay, distance is my y and time is my x, okay? So we're looking at a graph that might look like this where time is here and distance is here. And it says a horizontal line segment. So give yourself a little visual so that you understand what's happening. If I'm looking at a horizontal line segment right now, my distance is not changing, but time is continuing. So that implies I'm not moving, okay? If I'm looking at a line segment that goes up and to the right, so something that might look like this, um, let me take this guy off for you, and then we'll add this guy, okay? So distance is increasing as time increases, so I'm moving away from whatever my starting point was, okay? And then going to the, going down into the right, so a graph that might look like this, okay? Distance is decreasing while time is increasing, and so then I'm returning to my starting destination. Okay, returning to my starting destination. Those are the sorts of things I would be looking for in your explanation, okay? So standing still, going away from where you started and moving back to where you started. Now, same uh, sort of setup, except I'm gonna change the scenario on you. Now I'm doing speed as a function of time, okay? Speed as a function of time. So again, now speed is my Y, not distance. So you gotta be careful of that. Time is still my X, time is still my independent. But what happens if I'm looking at a horizontal line segment? Well, my speed is not changing. You gotta be careful here. Lots of kids will tell me, oh, that means I'm not moving. I am moving, I'm moving at a constant speed, okay? The speed is not changing. I'm not getting faster, I'm not getting slower. I'm just staying exactly where I am. If I want to not be moving and it's a graph that deals with speed, then my speed has to reach zero. So my graph actually has to come down to the bottom and hit the bottom. Okay, a line segment going up and to the right would mean I'm getting faster and a lot or accelerating and a line segment going down and to the right would mean I'm getting slower. Okay, again though, it's just getting slower. If you want to stop, you have to hit a speed of zero in order to actually confidently say that you've stopped. Okay, okay take a look at this guy. Um, <clears throat> the following depicts a journey on a pedal bike. Determine the point at which the bike has reached the top of the hill. Explain your reasoning. Now, I'd like to end with this question because lots of kids will look at this picture and they'll immediately say, oh, top of the hill, I'm at B. You have to interpret what you're looking at. This is speed, okay? So B actually represents my fastest time. If I'm on a pedal bike, I would not be getting my fastest time when I'm at the top of the hill, I would actually be getting my slowest time at the top of the hill because as I'm, as I'm, gravity is pushing against me. So as I'm climbing the hill, you get slower and slower and slower as you keep going up the hill, okay? So D would actually be the point where I'm at the top of the hill because my speed is the slowest, okay? You gotta be careful that you don't just look at a picture and make an assumption, okay? B would actually represent at the bottom of the hill because I've just spent the whole time going down a hill. So my speed gets quicker and quicker and quicker because gravity is going with me, okay? So the answer here would be D. At this point, my speed is the slowest, so I must almost be at the top, okay? So that's it for today. Um, just a little bit of 
a chance to review domain and range as well as to start going through just some interpreting graphs. Okay, we're going to pick it up on uh, here with your next lesson as well. Um, and we'll look at drawing some graphs next time. Um, and then that'll actually be the end of this unit. So uh, as always, please connect with me if you have any questions. And in the meantime, enjoy doing math. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.